being the last speaker, uh, I have two challenges. One, everything has been said that I could possibly say. Uh, and you all want to do something else. You want to get up and have a drink or something. Uh, let me say, I have a very different perspective from everybody I have heard today, first of all. I voted Remain, uh, but I have a perspective that we are going to have uh, Theresa May's deal accepted by the House of Commons on the 12th of March. There is not going to be a no deal Brexit. There's going to be a deal Brexit. I know, I know people are incredulous about this, uh, but uh, I think the way she has played it, I know everybody thinks she's stupid. Uh, I think the way she's played it is one of the most sophisticated things I've ever seen. She's going to squeeze the Brexiteers until 12th of March and then tell them, listen, you throw this out and you won't get a Brexit. So this is your last chance saloon and the ERG and all those uh, boys will march up. Uh, she will win by about 10 votes. That's all you need in the House of Commons. Okay, having, having sort of said slightly controversial thing, uh, let me say I'm actually not a pessimist about UK at all. I have been here for 54 years. This is 54, I wasn't born here. Uh, in those 54 years, the UK has managed several structural transformations which people have forgotten. I think someone quoted Churchill's uh, great sort of uh, 1948 speech. The empire is gone. Within my lifetime and within my stay here, UK has lost an empire. At one stage, people thought losing an empire would be economically catastrophic. All sorts of Leninists thought empire is what keeps UK alive. Not true. I know when, uh, when the question of Europe came up first in the early 60s, uh, Gatesco said, you know, a thousand years of our history, uh, you know, Commonwealth is what we are going to die for, and we are not going to have it. And in 1972-73, I was here, we agreed to go in. And why did we agree to go in? Because we thought we were the sick man of Europe, and Europe was dynamic and progressive, thing like that. We had to join Europe. At that time, I have to, I have to say, there was a group of uh, economists at the LSE that I was teaching who actually said uh, UK ought to join a North Atlantic free trade area, which was no longer not there yet. So there was the other circle, uh, which was, so that, that choice was it, that choice was not taken. UK took Europe as a choice to revive its economy. And then halfway through came the Thatcher Revolution which totally transformed the economy once again. And my, my own perception is that the Thatcher transformation revived the British economy so much that at that stage, a lot of people in the UK decided, hey, we are not a sick man of Europe at all. We can manage. And roughly from the time she resigned uh, in 1998, uh, we have had the European division in the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party has been decided, uh, divided over, over Europe for la whatever, the last 30 years. And this is the final stage of it. The Labour Party was actually by and large against Europe. And our glorious leader is still against Europe. Uh, but we were convinced by Jacques Delors. They said, you come stay in Europe and all the bad things that you did to you would go away. So the, so the Labour Party became a Remain Party. I'm saying all this history because a lot of it has been forgotten. Along the way, there have been several economic transformations. 
globally and within the UK. We are no longer a manufacturing country. Seriously. Manufacturing is a very small part of the economy. It's mainly uh, on one or other very sophisticated, uh, high-tech, uh, uh, large corporations, or lots of uh, uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises which are suppliers to uh, the large scale. But in terms of uh, employment, uh, manufacturing is sort of of 10%, if it's that. We are a service economy. We buy and larger service economy. I mean, when you say in with all the gloom, this is still the fifth largest economy in the world. And it has been done so because it has continually transformed itself at every challenge it has met. It has, it, it has met it. And I think what, pe what people have not actually looked at the future of technology and future of the global economy. It, uh, my, my title said I was going to talk about the global economy, so I thought I'd, let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, you know, UK, UK, for example, is a lead economy in fintech. You know, how did UK become the lead economy in fintech? Because it has the environment for encouraging innovation, probably the best environment any country has in the world in backing innovation. UK also is a leading country in artificial intelligence. It has a good thing in robotics. And those are the coming things. So UK has managed, not as not necessarily as a result of a EU membership, but it has managed to begin the next transformation of the economy, which will make it a uh, even more prosperous service economy that, than it is so far. Of course, there'll be, there'll be short run, uh, shock effects. I don't deny this. These numbers are obviously good numbers. Uh, and, you know, at each shock, you just have to adjust. You know, I mean, that, that I think is a great thing about this. It, when the uncertainty of Brexit is over, when we know on the 29th of March, which way we are going, quo what is? Then I think the British economy is resilient enough, it's innovative enough, it is flexible enough to adjust. You know, agriculture will shrink. Manufacturing trade will shrink. But hey, we've lived through all these ones before. I mean, our, the, the, the British economy in 20, 19 is no longer the British economy even in, in you know, in 1999 or 1979. So an economy survives by changing constantly. And it will be a huge shock. There's no doubt about it. But my view is that rather than think of a variety of ways in which it cannot happen or will not happen, you know, a second referendum will happen and second that will suddenly it was a large majority for Remain, uh, and so we'll be out of this thing. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think there is a majority in Parliament for a second referendum yet. There is not a majority for <coughs> no Brexit in Parliament. There is not a majority for a no-deal Brexit in Parliament. And there just may be, briefly, on the 12th of March, a small majority for Brexit under the deal. So I think one, one really ought to start thinking. I think the Labour Party came too late to second referendum, but that, that's, that's a, that's a second-order problem. And I think one way to think about, uh, you know, I call it rational pessimism, but I think it's also quite optimistic. It is going to happen, and then we say, what do we do now that it's going to happen? And I think what, what, what we are going to do with this economy, uh, I mean, after all, it has one of the highest levels of higher education in the world. If Trinity College Cambridge was a country, it would be high ranking in the number of Nobel Prizes. Uh, uh, it has won, right? It's one of the most sophisticated and flexible labor market there is in the world. 
which is why today in the middle of all the uncertainty, the highest proportion of people employed, lowest unemployment with a wage growth. So, you know, I think all this doom and gloom is because we're not going to be like what we were. Tough luck. Who is? Who is? No other country is. So we've got to get on. And I think this economy will get on. This economy is full of people who are very, very good. Okay? And since my time is running out, or because I'm not saying things he wants to hear, he wants me to stop. Let me just say one thing. One thing rather unpleasant before I go. I think you should never have an all-day seminar with only one woman speaker. I have to say that. I always say that. I always point out wherever I go of the, of the inequality in numbers. 